I was solicited to go round the world on a lecture tour by a man in Australia. I asked him what they wanted to be lectured on. He wrote back that those people were very coarse and serious and that they would like something solid, something in the way of education, something gigantic. And he proposed that I prepare about three or four lectures at any rate on just morals, any kind of morals, but just morals, and I like that idea. I liked it very much, and was perfectly willing to engage in that kind of work, and I should like to teach morals. I have a great enthusiasm in doing that, and I shall like to teach morals to those people. I do not like to have them talk to me, and I do not know any duller entertainment than that, but I know I can produce a quality of goods that will satisfy those people. If you teach principles, why, you had better let your illustrations come first. Illustrations which shall carry home to every person. I planned my first lecture on morals. I must not stand here and talk on that. Get out a watch. I am talking the first time now, and I do not know anything about the length of it. I would start with two or three rules of moral principles which I want to impress upon those people. I will just make the lecture gradual by and by. The illustrations are the most important, so that when that lecture is by and by written and completed, it will be just a waveless ocean with this archipelago of smiling green islands of illustrations in the midst of it. I thought I would state a principle which I was going to teach. I have this theory for doing a great deal of good out there, everywhere in fact, that you should prize as a priceless thing every transgression, every crime that you commit. The lesson of it, I mean. Make it permanent. Impress it so that you may never commit that same crime again as long as you live. Then you will see yourself what the logical result of that will be, that you get interested in committing crimes. You will lay up in that way, course by course, the edifice of a personally perfect moral character. You cannot afford to waste any crime. They are not given to you to be thrown away, but for a great purpose. There are 462 crimes possible, and you cannot add anything to this. You cannot originate anything. These have been all thought out, all experimented on, and have been thought out by the most capable men in the penitentiary. Now, when you commit a transgression... Lay it up in your memory, and without stopping, it will all lead toward moral perfection. When you have committed your 462, you are released of every possibility and have ascended the staircase of faultless creation, and you finally stand with your 462 complete with absolute moral perfection. And I am more than two-thirds up there. It is immense inspiration to find yourself climbing that way and have not much further to go. I shall have then that moral perfection and shall then see my edifice of moral character standing far before the world, all complete. I know that this should produce it. Why? The first time that I ever stole a watermelon. I think it was the first time, but this is no matter. It was right along there somewhere. I carried that watermelon to a secluded bower. You may call it a bower, and I suppose you may not. I carried that watermelon to a secluded bower in the lumber yard and broke it open, and it was 
Green. Now then, I began to reflect. There is the virtual, that is the beginning of reformation when you reflect. When you do not reflect, that transgression is wasted on you. I began to reflect, and I said to myself, I have done wrong. It was wrong in me to steal that watermelon, that kind of watermelon. And I said to myself, Now what would a right-minded and right-intentioned boy do who found that he had done wrong, stolen a watermelon like this? What would he do? What must he do? Do right. Restitution. Make restitution. He must restore that property to its owner. And I resolved to do that. And the moment I made that good resolution, I felt that electrical moral uplift which becomes a victory over wrongdoing. I was spiritually strengthened and refreshed and carried that watermelon back to that wagon and gave it to that farmer, restored it to him. And I told him he ought to be ashamed of himself going around working off green watermelons that way on people who had confidence in him. And I told him in my perfectly frank manner it was wrong. I said that if he did not stop, he could not have my custom. And he was ashamed. He was ashamed. He said he would never do it again. And I believe that I did that man a good thing as well as one for myself. He did reform. I was severe with him a little, but that was all. I restored the watermelon and made him give me a ripe one. I morally helped him. And I have no doubt that I helped myself at the same time for. That was a lesson which remained with me for my perfection. Ever since that day to this, I never stole another one. Like that. Now that brings me by natural and easy transition to Simon Wheeler of California. A pioneer he was, and in a small way a philosopher. Simon Wheeler's creed was that pretty nearly everything that happens to a man can be turned to moral account. Every incident in his life almost can be made to assist him, to project him forward morally, if he knows how to make use of the lesson which that episode teaches, and he used, well, he was a good deal of a talker. He was an inordinate talker. In fact, he wore out three sets of false teeth. And I told about a friend of his one day, a man that he had known there formerly and who he had a great admiration for, of one Jim Smiley. And he said it was worth a man's while to know Jim Smiley. Jim Smiley was a man of gift. He was a man of parts. He was a man of learning. He was. Well, he was the curiousest man about always betting on anything that turned up that you ever see, if he could get anybody to bet on the other side. And if he couldn't, he would change sides. As soon as he got a bet, he was satisfied. He prepared himself with all sorts of things, tomcats, rat terriers, and all such things, and one day he catched a frog. Said he calculated to educate him. And he took him home and never done nothing but sat in his backyard and learned that frog how to jump. Yes, sir. And he did. Learn him, too. He did. Learn him, too. When it came to jumping on a dead level, there wasn't no frog that could touch him at all. Come to jump on the dead level, why? He could lay over any frog in the profession. And Smiley broke all the camps around there betting on that frog. By and by, he got a misfortune. He used to keep his frog in a little lattice box. The frog's name was Daniel Webster. And he would bring that box downtown and lay for a bet. And one day a fellow came along, a stranger in the camp he was. He says, What might it be that you've got in the box? Well, Smiley says, 
It ain't anything particular. It's only just a frog. Well, he says, what's, what is it good for? Well, Smiley says, I don't know, but I think he is good enough for one thing. He can outjump any frog in Calaveras County. The stranger took that box, turned it around this way and that way, and he examined Daniel Webster all over very critically and handed it back, and he said, I don't see any points about that frog that is any better than any other frog. Oh, Smiley says, it may be that you understand frogs, and may be that you are only an amateur, so to speak. Anyway, I will risk $40 that he can outjump any frog in Calabas County. Well, that stranger looked mighty sad, mighty sorrowful, grieved. And he said, I'm only a stranger in camp, and I ain't got no frog. But if I had a frog, I would bet you. Smiley says, that's all right. Just you hold my frog a minute. I will go and get you a frog. So Smiley led out to the swamp, and that stranger took that box, and he stood there. Well, he stood and stood and stood the longest time. At last, he got Daniel Webster out of the box and pried his mouth open like that took a teaspoonful and filled him full of quail shot, filled him full up to the chin and set him down on the floor. Daniel sat there. Smiley, he flopped around in the swamp about half an hour. Finally, he cotched a frog and fetched him to this fellow. They put up the money and Smiley says, Now, let the new frog down on the floor with this front paws just even with Daniel's and I will give the word. He says, one, two, three, scoop. And they touched up the frog from behind to indicate that time was called. And that new frog, he rose like a rocket and came down kerchunk, a yard and a half from where he started, a perfectly elegant jump for a non-professional that way. But Smiley's frog gave a heave or two with his shoulders. His ambition was up, but it was no use. He couldn't budge. He was anchored there as solid as an anvil. The fellow took the money, and finally, as he went away, he looked over his shoulder at Daniel, and he said, Well, I don't see any points about that frog that is any better than any other frog. And Smiley looked down at Daniel Webster. I never see a man so puzzled. And he says, I do wonder what that frog threw it off for. There must be something the matter with him. Looks mighty baggy somehow. He hefted him and says, Blame my cats if he don't weigh five pounds. Turned him upside down and showered out a hat full of shot. When Simon Wheeler said, that has been a lesson to me. And I say to you, let that be a lesson to you. Don't you put too much faith in the passing stranger. This life is full of uncertainties and every episode in life, figuratively speaking, is just a frog. You want to watch every exigency as you would a frog. And don't you ever bet a cent on it until you know whether it is loaded or not. <laughs>